Hey, what's up everyone? How's everyone doing out there today? Welcome back to Wildcat MTG and uh, Modern Horizons 3 is is basically here, right? It is on, we are on the cusp, we're on the doorstep of Modern Horizons 3 and uh, needless to say, my excitement level is quite high. Um, this is an event, like this is for me something, Modern Horizons 3 is something that I've had essentially circled on my calendar since the start of the year and many of you can attest to that as uh, we've had you know conversations in the comments and, and conversations with the patrons. So uh, I am I am in full excitement mode here. So we're gonna do my top ten list of the cards that I'm most excited about, and you know, just kind of before we delve into the list, I, I want to talk a little bit about what that means. I'm not going for uh, top ten most valuable cards, top ten most powerful cards. I think really power level is really you know dependent on the format, um, and you know who's who knows what happens with with the value. But today this video is about just the cards that really resonated with me as I was looking over the set. The cards that I saw that immediately stuck out to me as cards that um that I'm excited about that draw my excitement that I can't wait to try out in a deck or jam into a deck or two. So that's where we start. And uh, with that being said, why don't we go ahead and dive on in the list here. So when I started constructing my list, I, I told myself, I kind of made a deal with myself, listen, you can pick a Johnny or Ocelot Pride. You can't take both of the cat cards just because they're, they're cat cards. You got to choose one. So uh, my number 10 card is Ocelot Pride. And uh, I think this is a incredibly neat creature. There's some intricacies to this card that I think are... are um, you know, interesting in terms of how they might play in the modern meta. So let's talk about the card first. It is one white for a 1-1 one, one first strike lifelink cat. It also has Ascend. So Ascend is if you control 10 or more permanents, you get the city's blessing for the rest of the game. And then this, the rest of the card reads, at the beginning of your end step, if you gained life this turn, create a 1-1 one, one white cat creature token. Then if you have the city's blessing for each token you control that entered the battlefield this turn, create a token that's a copy of it. So you can imagine that with the, the token and the creation uh, of additional tokens and copies that this could domino very and snowball very quickly. Um, how I think this plays in is at a one, you know, for a one for a one, one first strike lifelink. So, you know, Immediately, I think, okay, the nice part is it wins battle with Ragavan, and that is huge because Ragavan was the one-drop creature and kind of has been for the last couple of years. On the other hand, the one defense makes it very susceptible to an Orcish Bowmaster. Um, it will win the, it may win the fight with an Orcish Bowmaster because of the first strike, but it also loses on the ping. So I don't know how this card actually plays in. I don't know if it's strong enough to actually make it, and I also don't know what, what, you know, archetype it, it fits into. I don't think it fits into an existing, but who knows what new archetypes will arrive from Modern Horizons 3. But uh, I definitely think this has a home in Commander decks. I This automatically for me slides into like a Jetmere deck um, because it's so easy to get the City's Blessing in that. And then, um, you know, you're making other tokens and that sort of thing. And it's pretty easy to gain life as well. So Ocelot Pride is a, is a card that uh, draws my excitement for a number of reasons, speaks and pulls at the heartstrings, and I uh, can't wait to jam into some decks. The next card on my list is Aether Revolt. Now I have to admit, I have a little bit of a soft spot for uh, a card that is named after a set. Um, and it's kind of for me like when you're watching a movie and they say the name of the movie in the movie that you're watching. Um, so Aether Revolt, it, it's a red enchantment. It's two colorless and two red mana. It reads as long as, it has Revolt and it says as long as a permanent you controlled left the battlefield this turn, if a source you control would deal non-combat damage to an opponent or permanent an opponent controls, it deals that much damage plus two instead. It also says whenever you get one or more energy, Aether Revolt deals that much damage to any target. So if you get one energy, you get to ping one thing, right? One damage. If you get 10 energy, that's 10 damage to any target. Um, I think this card pairs well with another card on my list and another card that has also caught some some hype during spoiler season because of also another card on this list is Green Pelt, uh, Green Belt Rampager. Um, so Green Belt Rampager is a one one green for a three four elephant, and it says whenever it enters the battlefield, you pay two energy. If you can't return Green Belt Rampager to its owner's hand, and you get an energy, so when you pair this with something like an Aether Revolt, so it enters, uh, you can't pay the two energy, assuming you don't have the two energy, right? Then you return Rampager to your hand and you get one energy. Well, if Aether Revolt is on the battlefield, now you've had a permanent you control leave the battlefield and you're getting one energy. So it's like a lightning bolt, right? A repeatable lightning bolt at that in multiple instances. Um, that's really neat. I, I don't know, you know, I wasn't playing during Magic during Kalish, so I didn't get to experience, uh, for better or worse, uh, energy the first time around. I really have only heard tail, and now we have some recent commander decks that have come out that have been kind of energy focused. Um, so I'm really intrigued to see 
what kind of builds come with this card included. I think it has some really cool possibilities to it. I don't know that it's going to be modern playable. Four mana is, is a lot for, you know, essentially building around kind of a memeish thing, but that doesn't make it not fun, and that doesn't mean I'm not willing to try. So uh, Aether Re Revolt is a card that I'm excited to try out. Next up is uh, Fanatic of Ronus, and this card is really sweet. Um, so, you know, two mana dorks in, in modern aren't really a thing, right? Because modern is such a fast format. But maybe this is the exception to the rule. So this is a, a one colorless, one green mana for a 1-4 snake druid that taps to add one green mana. Additionally, it has Ferocious, which says tap to add four green mana. Activate only if you control a creature with power four or greater. And then it also has Eternalize, so that means that for two green and two colorless, uh, you can exile this creature from your graveyard and create a zombie that's a copy of it, except it's a 4-4 black zombie. Um, you can only do it as a sorcery speed. But, you know, forever we've had this this saying in magic that is bolt the bird, referring to birds of paradise and referring to the lightning bolt, which basically means like if somebody plays a, a birds of paradise, you, you kill it, right? Because it's going to enable them to do something even more fierce with that extra mana. Except for with Fanatic of Ronus, you can't really bolt it because it's a 1-4. Yes, there's plenty of ways to still remove it, um, but... A 1-4 is not easily disposed of. It makes for a pretty good blocker as well. And also, you know, even at two mana, it gets you at least one green mana for ramp. And if you can land a four power creature, and there are ways to do that, it is modern after all, uh, tapping it for four green can really turn things up. So Fanatic of Ronus is, I think, a card that I think is is clearly going to be in Commander and I think might have a sh uh, chance to see play in uh, modern as well. Number seven card on the list today is Invert Polarity. So this is a new take on a counterspell. This is a is it counterspell. So it's two blue and one red mana instant. Choose target spell, then flip a coin. If you win the flip, gain control of that spell, and you may choose new targets for it. If you lose the flip, counter that spell. So let's let's talk about the obvious here. Three mana counterspell is is cancel, except for this is a more mana intensive, a more mana restrictive cancel because it is still while it's still three mana. It requires a very specific mana combination, right? And Cancel is not exactly modern playable. However, I'm going to make the argument that there are spells in modern that do require three mana. You're not usually paying that as the mana cost, but it's not it's not crazy for for you to pay for a Force of Negation or another spell that we'll talk on this about the, on this list a little bit later. Uh, the, the challenge with any f uh, coin flip card is that normally if you lose the flip, you don't get the the desired result and, and you don't get anything for your efforts in spending mana. Um, invert polarity, not so much, right? So let's talk about if you lose the flip. If you lose the flip, you countered the spell. So even if you lose the coin flip, you've you've gotten a cancel, right? You, you've paid three mana and you've countered a target spell. That is the worst case scenario. On the other hand, if you win the flip, you gain control of that spell. And to be clear, that is not necessarily an instant or sorcery. That could be a one ring. That could be a creature. Uh, you gain control of that spell. So that you win the coin flip on your three mana investment. You not only just countered it, but you also actually gain control of it. That's a that's a WW, right? Um, really interesting spell. I I don't know if it's modern playable. Well, you know, I, I, again, I, I have no idea. I, I want it to be because I think the upside of this card is is incredible right gaining control of the spell stealing your opponent's spell for three mana is one of the cheapest ways we've ever seen to do that so a uh, really cool spell and i will definitely be giving it a shot and and who knows who knows it's got such a powerful effect with such a small downside that uh, i'm intrigued by it to say the least Okay, so I'm not going to make us uh, wait and drag this out to talk about the other counter spell on the list. It's a very uh, popular one, and a lot of people are very excited about this card, and that is Flare of Denial. So Flare of Denial, one colorless and two blue mana instant. You may sacrifice a non-token blue creature rather than pay the spell's mana cost and counter target spell. It is a strictly better cancel. Um, and it is uh, part of the free spell cycle here in, in Modern Horizons 3. And, uh, you know, it's interesting. Like... I, free spell a free counter spell right and we talk about for force of negation force of negation sees a bunch of play um force of negation is you know a target non-creature spell whereas flare of denial is just counter target spell however the restriction is well it's restrictive because sacrificing a non-token blue creature blue isn't exactly a, a a color known that is to be flush with with creatures that you could just you know sacrifice at any time you need to so i'm interested to see 
how this card is, is going to see play. Like without a doubt, whether Commander and, and like very likely Modern, this card is going to see play. I'm just curious as to what decks are going to be able to take the most advantage of it, it being that you have to sacrifice a creature. Now, we just talked about with, with previously with Invert Polarity, the restriction on that. And it being, if, you, if you're going to cast, it has to be three mana. Well, Flare of Denial might be a spell that you may not have a blue creature to, to sacrifice. So there's there may be plenty of decks still paying three mana for a counter spell. Um, but there's no doubt in my mind that Flare of Denial is going to see play. I'm just curious as to uh, what, what deck is going to be able to best take advantage of it to actually make it a free spell consistently and reliably. So we have arrived at the top five cards that I'm most excited about from Modern Horizons 3. And uh, so the free cycle of spells is called the Flares, right? Flare of Denial. And, and the red one, and, and this is the one that uh, I'm going to call it my Rick Flare because when I read this card, I went, woo! Uh, all right, that was pretty bad. But uh, it is a card that I'm very excited about. So let's talk about Flare of Dupl Duplication here. So that is one colorless and two red mana. It is an instant red. You may sacrifice a non-token red creature rather than pay the spell's mana cost. Copy target instant or sorcery spell. You may choose new targets for the copy. So red has a lot of copy spell effects, right? It's in that color pie for sure. The challenge with any copy spell spell is that it costs mana, right? So I have to invest mana into the spell that allows me to copy the spell. And then I actually have to then cast the spell that I want it to be copied. And all of that is very mana intensive. But but what if I told you the copy effect was free? And that's what we're talking about here, right? Now, I don't know what this is. Does this, is this um, am I doubling up a goblin bomb? Uh, that's pretty cool. Am I doubling up a tribal flames? Also pretty sweet. Or am I doubling up a take an extra turn spell? That is like the kind of play that I'm here for. Um, that's the sort of thing where I'm like, man, the possibilities seem really strong with this card because if, if I can get away with the copy effect being free, I mean, again, even if you counter the original spell, I still get to copy it. So, hey, I'm going to get a casting out of this one way or the other. And, and if it's something like a take an extra turn you know, effect or a spell, that makes it really sweet because those cards are, are notoriously high mana value because they have such a powerful effect. But if you don't have to invest anything in the, in the thing that's going to allow you to copy it, no mana, that to me is taking adv max advantage of being able to do something ridiculous like take take extra turns. So Flare of Duplication, you know, again, whether we're doubling up Goblin Bomb and we're rushing our opponent and at which point you're going to have plenty of fodder to throw at them. Uh, things like Tribal Flames come to mind with where Modern is at right now or the super greedy, egregious... Uh, taking extra turns. I'm here for all of that. Flare of Duplication is a card that I am very hyped for. At number four, we have the incredibly interesting Necrodominance. And I'm old enough to remember Necropotence running an absolute muck when it was legal. And uh, I mean, there is a, a term, Necro Summer, because it was just all over the place. And the funny part about Necropotence is when that card was previewed back in Ice, you know, at the beginning of Ice Age, people thought that card was junk. And then it absolutely just wrecked. Um, so there's some similarities here. Let's talk about Necrodominance and it's similar to Necropotence. So like Necropotence, it is a three black legendary enchantment. Uh, skip your draw step. Necrodominance reads, at the beginning of your end step, you may pay any amount of life if you do draw that many cards. Your maximum hand size is five. And if a card or token would be put in your graveyard from anywhere, exile it instead. So a few noticeable differences here. We'll talk about the hand size thing in a, in a, in a second here. But one thing I will point out is Necropotent says if you would discard a card, exile. This card says if a card or token would be put in your graveyard from anywhere, exile it instead. So that I think is a meaningful slight but slight change. The maximum hand size, I think, is the people the thing people key on is the obvious drawback, but I honestly don't think it's that big of a deal. The one thing that actually concerns me about Necrodominance and and whether it's playable or not, specifically in modern, I think Commander, no problem. Um, but as far as whether it's actually going to be modern playable is the noticeable difference is that this is at the beginning of your end step. It has to make it to your end step. Whereas with Necropotence, it was an activation, zero, pay one life. So if somebody wanted to disenchant your Necropotence, yeah, no problem. I'll just activate it in response, and then I'll put those cards into my hand at the beginning of my next end step. So yes, I would have to pay the life. Yes, I would have to make it to the beginning of my next end step. But you're not going to stop me from putting cards in my hand. With Necrodominance, it, that has to be on the battlefield to begin your end step for you in order for you to, to get that triggered ability off of it, right? And with things like Leyline Binding, with things like Force of Vigor, um, that does concern me. I'm not concerned about the maximum hand size, but I do get concerned that I, it's not going to actually be on the battlefield to start my end step so that I can't take advantage of it. What I do know is that if it is, and I do, and I get to refill my hand, this card is, is going to be a problem. 
Um, that is <laughs> that is the power of a necropotence type effect is if you get to just at will, you know, restock your hand. And by the way, before you get to discard, if you have things that you can cast or do at instant speed, you can certainly do those things and, and get your hand before you have to discard a hand size anyway. Um, I'm just concerned about whether this card is actually going to stick because unlike the original Necropotence, it actually does have to make it to a certain point. You don't get to just draw cards because you want to. So Necrodominance is a card I'm very intrigued by. Yes, it is a card that I'll be jamming into some commander decks uh, because it's if nothing else, it feels like redundancy. Um, but uh, jury's still out on the playability in Modern. So the number three card I have on my list is Primal Prayers, and this is a card that I think is really sweet. So one of the other things we're getting with Modern Horizons 3 is like a bunch of uh, old school cards kind of reimagined using energy as a mechanic incorporated to be with the card. So Primal Prayers mimics um, Alluren. So this is a four mana green enchantment. It's two colorless and two green. And this is when Primal Prayers enters the battlefield, you get two energy. You may cast creature spells with mana value three or less by paying one energy rather than paying their mana cost. If you cast a spell this way, you may cast as though it had flash. I originally misread this card and I kind of just in my head filled in the blanks and it was like, oh, you may pass cast three cards, you know, uh, three mana value less cards by paying that in energy. And, and it's not. It's just one energy for a three mana value or less. So, you know, just being able to actually play creatures at flash speed is a huge benefit in its own right. Being able to play them for free is absolutely bonkers, right? You get two free energy with this card. Granted, it is a four mana value card in its own right, but you get two energy when Primal Purrs enters the battlefield, which means that you can put in, you can flash in two, three mana value or less green, uh, not green, just creatures. Uh, by paying energy cost. Um, so this is a card I teased a little bit earlier when we were talking about Aether Revolt and there was another card. I said there's another card on here that I think kind of uh, pairs very well with this. So I talked about the Green Belt Rampager and with Primal Prayers, Rampager enters the battlefield. So it, it takes a mana, it takes an energy to, to play the, the Green Belt. Then if you don't have two energy, it pops back to your hand and then you get an energy. So basically it just cycles with primal prayers over and over again and if you have aether revolt in the battlefield that you're just basically you get to just win right it's three damage three damage three damage three damage that is very memeish because you have two four mana value uh, enchantments on the battlefield at the same time but i'm not above trying that out um primal prayers i think is a card that does well and it just stands on its own as a, as a card that's going to have really good use because you know modern has a ton of really good value efficient creatures that are three mana value or less so you know with or without Aether, Aether Revolt and Green Belt Rampager, I think this card is good. Um, paired with those two, I, I'm, I'm interested in trying it. So uh, that's our number three card today. The number two card on my list is Ulamog the Defiler. And I think Ulamog is, I think this card is just an absolute house. So we've known we were getting Eldrazi for some time. Emrakul was spoiled pretty early on. I think Magic on Chicago, if memory serves. Um, but when I saw Ulamog, my, my jaw may have actually hit the floor. So there's a lot to unpack with this card. Let's talk about it. It's 10 mana, 10 colorless mana for a 7-7. Seven, seven. When you cast a spell, target opponent exiles half of their library, round it up. Has a ward of sacrifice to permanent. So, you know, unless it's like an edict effect where your opponent's making you sacrifice something, if they're going to target it, it's going to cost them. Uh, Ulamog the Defiler enters the battlefield with a number of plus one, plus one counter rounds on it equal to the greatest mana value among cards in exile. And then Ulamog has a Annihilator X where X is the number of plus one, plus one counters on it. Um, notably, the Exile, naturally we pair the cast trigger of exiling half a library with the plus one, plus one counters. But the plus one, plus one counters, ETB just says greatest amount of value among cards in exile. With Evoke Elementals running around, whether it's you, whether it's your opponent that is using them, you're ditching, you're pitching cards to, to play those and those count as a card in exile. So... Um, and, and then Annihilator X where, you know, whether it's a four mana value, three mana value, it really doesn't take a lot for Annihilator to be effective. And, and so, you know, where I'm most curious about, I, I think hard casting is going to be tough, but I, I, I think there's a universe where Gorio's Vengeance and Ulamog are paired very nicely together. Um, you know, one of the things I really haven't talked about is that I, I you know, for my list, I stayed away from reprints. Um, not that I'm not excited about fetch lands and things like that, but you know, hey, I want to talk about the shiny new toys. But of note, one of the things that we are getting in modern now is Phyrexian Tower. So is there a universe where uh, I am pitching a card to evoke a grief, 
picking apart my opponent's hand, and then with the evoke trigger on the stack, sacrificing it to Phyrexian Tower to get two black mana, using that to Gorio's Vengeance and pick the Ulamog out of my bin up, and then swinging with an Annihilator trigger to effectively end the game? I don't know, but I'm going to try. <laughs> um, that's a pretty disgusting example of uh, I, what I think this card could do. And that Annihilator trigger, and again, even if it's Ward, like they, they have to be able to ditch permanence just to be able to target it to begin with. So... Ulamog's Defiler, I think, is a, a really, really insane card. Um, and, and there's so many versions of it where, you know, again, it's just plus one, plus one counters. There's a million ways to put plus one, plus one counters on things, even if you there's no cards in Exile. So uh, it's a card I'm looking forward to. Yes, it's going to see a ton of play, specifically in Commander and Eldrazi decks and that sort of thing. But I'm intrigued to know uh, if it has a home in Modern as well. And finally, the number one card that I am most excited for from Modern Horizons 3 is Shifting Woodland. Uh, Shifting Woodland enters the battlefield tapped unless you control a forest, tapped to add one green mana, and then it has Delirium and then a two green, two colorless activation. Shifting Woodland becomes a copy of target permanent card in your graveyard until end of turn. Activate only if there are four more card types among cards in your graveyard. So Delirium is something I don't think a deck just naturally does. You have to work for it a little bit, but in modern, there's plenty of ways, specifically because you have fetch lands. That's a really easy way to get one card type in the graveyard, no problem. Creatures, maybe an enchantment, instant sorcery. So it, it is there, but it is something I think you're going to have to work for a little bit. But let's talk about what the possibilities for this card. So one, I really enjoy that it's non-legendary. Um, the fact that you can then comfortably carry it as a four of in your deck and it enters the battlefield tapped unless you control four. So maybe you play it on turn one tapped, no big deal. Most of the time you're playing some sort of shock land or something anyway, and that's usually tapped. Um, it, it can tap for green mana so that, you know, right away, so you don't have to worry about it, you know, necessarily and enters the battlefield tapped and unable to use it. And then the ability to become a copy of target permanent in your graveyard. So again, notably, it's, four to activate, but it can also tap for green mana. So if you're copying like an, inst uh, an excuse me, an enchantment uh, or, or, you know, an artifact or something like that, it really is only three other mana sources because you can tap the woodland itself and an enchantment being tapped doesn't really matter. So you can tap the shifting woodland for a green mana and then pay three other mana and have it become a, per a target, a copy of target permanent. If it's a creature, it really is four mana uh, on top of the shifting woodland. Um, but, you know, the, the obvious play here, I think, is like an Omniscience. If you have an Omniscience in your graveyard and then you have Shifting Woodland become a copy of that, then you just cast, you just unload your hand. Um, but there's also a lot of other really cool uses for this card. I think it has a lot of strong possibilities. I think it's basically a commander staple in any deck that's playing green. You know, the fact that, it, again, it's not legendary. I mean, not that it matters com for commander so much, but that you can play it uh, untapped pretty comfortably and just have it become a, a copy of a target permanent pretty easily as well. Um, this card, I think, is pretty busted, um, but we'll see what shakes up of it. Uh, you know, really interesting card. I can't wait to try it out. So that is it for my top 10. Now I would love to hear from you. What are the cards from Modern Horizons 3 that get your creative juices flowing? What are the cards that you look at and you cannot wait because you already have a deck you know, built that's just perfect for that card or a card that has inspired your creativity where you're like, I can't wait to build around that card. Let me know in the comments what are your cards you're excited for. That's it for me today. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. And if you did, do me a favor. If you're not subscribed already, hit the subscribe button for me. Hit the like button for me. And by all means, drop me some comments. I appreciate each and every one of you. Thank you so much, everybody, and be well.